Good afternoon, and I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of this event for the opportunity to present today, but as well for everyone staying on. I know it's a long day, so thank you for that. So just briefly, um, this session is on surgical site infection prevention and on a quality improvement initiative that we introduced to reduce the risk of readmission for SSI, but I think as importantly, really, to improve the information we're giving to patients and carers to help them with self-management during a really acute period of time in their recovery. This session will just go over the burden that we see within the cardiac surgery group before going on to discuss the photo at discharge. So we know that surgical site infection is an important quality indicator for clinicians, patients, as well as policymakers. For the patient, there's profound impact following the SSI in, in cardiac surgery where we know the consequences can be quite severe. A patient told me that mentally the experience of having a serious wound infection placed him under tremendous stress and that he and his family were suffering in terms of financial revenue from his time in hospital, which was actually months and months. Physically, the consequences of a sternal wound infection can be devastating. Mediastinitis is associated with a one in three mortality rate still during the current times. Patient, the, the photo here is actually a, an infection that began at the graft site and it was pressing against the chest wall, which actually prevented it from rupture. But you can see here an example of a serious infection from the inside out. We know that patients who suffer these SSIs can have returns to theater, readmissions, and they can lose their sternum, or even for a submammary incision, they can lose significant tissue. From the work of Judith Tanner in surgical site infection prevention, we know that patients and their carers suffer tremendous stress and distress as a consequence of SSI. So it is against this backdrop of the impact on our patients that we move on to talk, unfortunately, about cost to the healthcare system. These don't really compare with the patient's experience, but I'm presenting today on some typical costs that we see associated with surgical site infection, as well as simply surgical wound dehiscence, which I think can be a category that's often overlooked within SSI rates. You can see that a superficial infection can be about 5,000 pounds to the service, but by the time patient need, requires readmission that requires return to theater, you're moving up to around 20,000 pounds. Our data suggested that during the 2010-2012 uh, period, readmissions for surgical site infection on average costed, cost approximately 28,000 pounds per annum. Now this is actually in keeping with international data on surgical site infection in cardiac surgery. Published reports report between 22 to 33,000 pounds when you're looking at costs associated not just with wards but also return to theater, intensive care, the medication and the like. We did find, however, that one of our hospital sites had a higher rate or higher cost associated with the management of SSI. And when we audited the same data period for just incisional SSI, we found that the addition of a um, plastic surgeon increased the cost between 15 to 30 percent. So it's having that expertise actually added, um, unsurprisingly, to the cost. There is, in the 28,000 um, pounds, the average, and this excludes the far right column, which is in red. This was a uh, catastrophic surgical site infection with aspergillus, and the management actually cost over half a million pounds. Unfortunately, in litigation, there was an additional 
over um, a claim from the patient's family, bringing this single case to over two million pounds. Now these costs are not directly um, uh, suffered by the healthcare system, there is of course insurance, but it's an example of why NHS resolution is right to look at litigation costs around not just healthcare associated infections, but more specifically with surgical site infection. So I'm along today to talk about an initiative, it's really a quality improvement project that we introduced back in 2014 to reduce the risk of avoidable surgical site infection readmission. The data, or this project sits really within the getting it right the first time context as well as the five year forward plan that focuses on avoiding these non-elective bed days. So for this section, I'm really focusing again on the readmission of SSIs in the cardiac patient group, and I'm providing data from two data sources. One is the Quality Improvement Initiative, and the second is looking at a propensity case score match data analysis. So I've already mentioned that surgical site infection is a leading cause of readmission, and this was acknowledged by the World Health Organization's first global uh, guidance on SSI prevention. At our center, we found that we were spending just over half a million pounds per annum managing wound infections. And this was taking up approximately 400 bed days per annum. And in turn, we were losing revenue of almost half a million again. During the period that we're discussing, actually our center wasn't particularly high. This is going back to 2008, 2012 period, five year period. When we were below the national benchmark at this time with a rate of around 4% against the national benchmark, which was historically then 7.1%. In a systematic review across all surgical categories, Wilbur et al. described that the highest proportion of SSI identification happened post-discharge. And they offered pooled estimates, including for cardiac surgery and coronary artery bypass surgery, that, suggesting that approximately 60% of SSIs are presenting post-discharge. And this led Shaw et al. from America to postulate that readmissions for SSI actually were a unique quality indicator um, to, to consider for hospital centers. So why do so many SSIs present post-discharge? Over 60% happen after leaving hospital and about 60% happen within the first 30 days, and the majority occur within two weeks of the patient going home. There's a very clear period of risk to the patient of developing the SSI, and this can be largely down to the time it takes the bacteria to elicit a host response, that is to present with signs and symptoms like inflammation or pus. It can be down to a delay in treatment, but either way, it's not helped, as Obama and Clinton suggested in their white paper in 2006, by the fragmented communication between acute and community care. So for this presentation, we're really talking about reducing the severity and duration of a wound infection by early detection. We're not talking so much about stopping it, we're talking about managing it. And yet, this is the information we're giving to our community colleagues on the wound appearance. It actually doesn't say anything about how the wound looks or what's normal for the patient in terms of, you know, is their discoloration normal for that patient? It's about when would we like to have the sutures and the surgical clips, if used, removed. And this is the information we're giving to our patients and carers. I'm not sure that generic information answers their questions. And this is because our patients have told us, when you say redness, what do you mean? So the aim of our initiative really is to speak to what Coleman et al. described as eliciting patient responsibility in the transition of care. 
but there are challenges. The first is that we know patient engagement with um, infection prevention is described by a global expert panel as in its infancy and requiring attention. We also know from multiple studies, not just that patients are poorly served by standard wound discharge advice, but they're overwhelmed by the amount of inv information that we give them. They feel not so great at the time they're going home, and they have very poor verbal recall. So saying your wound looks good maybe won't be um, kept within their memory. We also know that the proportion that we want to have a response that's proportionate. The majority of wound concerns, or the majority of surgical wounds rather, I'm sorry, heal well. We don't need to worry patients unnecessarily. We can expect the majority will have a linear process, so we don't want to increase the patient workload, which is described by Zelmer et al. in 2015, uh, by way of patients repeatedly taking pictures or, or having to have telephone conversations. And we also want it to be balanced for the healthcare system. We know in the UK we, we have a digital uh, future ahead, but we are still catching up with that vision. So we offer a photo at discharge. The picture is taken of the patient's surgical wound on the day they go home. It's a color picture. The information that accompanies the wound includes clear wound assessment. So the swelling at the top is normal and should resolve within a couple of weeks. It also goes over wound protection advice, so it's not necessarily about in prevention, preventing uh, high microbioburden with washes. It's also about supporting the incision, and for instance, with ladies, support wear or, or bracing for a cough for all patients. It's very low cost, which, which speaks to the idea of being proportionate, but I'm not sure that we haven't maybe called it the wrong thing. It's not just a photo, it is also the information about microbiology that uh, the, pay, the, the hospital has on the day of discharge, about the tailored advice I mentioned. It's about quality control and compliance reporting. It's about how we're saving, storing, and using these images as well. We know if you just let people take pictures, there can be quality control issues. So the photo at discharge actually is an approach that includes the database so that you can review things and have compliance reporting, as well as um, using the assessment to accompany the photo. The photo is simply an adjunct to the assessment. It is not a standalone resource. So we've done a lot of auditing. <laughs> we've asked our nurses, we've asked our clinicians, we've asked our GPs, we've asked our patients. And we feel that the strong message back is this, as a GP puts it, is a positive and progressive step. It will provide the patient with reassurance in terms of ongoing management. So that link between acute and community care, which we know isn't always as it should be. And it's also for uh, in interesting how it might help help clinicians reviewing the wound. There's a lot on antimicrobial stewardship being presented, and there's never a problem treating a wound infection appropriately. The issue really is about avoiding unnecessary antibi antibiotic um, therapy. Having these pictures as well have, has provided a fantastic tool. We have these pictures as standard on all our surgical patients. So when somebody is readmitted, we can uh, start on a front foot rather than a back foot. As someone working in surgical site infection surveillance, if I'd had the patient picture on the right, I would have been really worried about how tight their bra was. Have we given them a problem with rubbing or something? But because I have the picture on the left, Yes, on the left, I can see that there is a diathermy injury at the bottom of the wound. So the heat source that cardiac surgeons use, the exit point is right at the bottom, and that, that uh, exit has burnt a bit of the friable or made friable tissue, 
fact, yeah, the skin won't heal over that area. Bacteria really thrive when there's a scab there. It's like a median for them, and they like to go in on the sides. So my takeaway from reviewing this wound concern isn't that the, the support wear was in an inappropriate side, size, it's rather about the diathermy injury or scab at the bottom of the wound. So how are we doing? Since we introduced the scheme in 2014, at the beginning it was the surveillance nurse that took the pictures. And you can see with the red arrows, this is when there's somebody working, they have annual leave, and it, they're not a 24-7 service. You'll get compliance between 20 to 40 percent. 40 percent is a bit ambitious to say. But when the staff surgical nurses took the initiative over in 2015, you can see a huge jump in compliance. Over the last three years, our staff have maintained a quality improvement approach of over 90% compliance, which is absolutely fantastic. Sometimes when you're asking staff to perform an extra activity, you're not going to see the compliance, but staff say the feedback from patients and family is so good that they feel that it's required. There was a blip in November 2017 when we lost a camera or two, uh, but it was, only, it was only for that month, I'm pleased to report. So have we reduced the duration and the severity of SSI? I think when we present the median, yes, we now have thousands of pictures, and um, we're able to draw some useful conclusions. The data now from Public Health England, um, I recognize that they've kindly provided this, and there's the, their license there at the bottom. They've provided the all hospital view of CABG and general cardiac readmission rates. The trends over the last five years in this patient group are increasing. In contrast, our rates are reducing significantly. We've also done propensity case score matching with our data set, looking at things like duration of op, length of stay, whether there's bilateral internal arteries, is your patient diabetic? And we can suggests that following the matching of 568 patients with the photo and 568 without, that there is a statistically significant reduction in the risk of readmission. And from this, we can speak to the um, cost avoided. By reducing the readmissions based on our PS match data, we're avoiding costs of approximately 130,000 pounds per annum, or if we just simply use the Public Health England data unmatched, we can suggest it's over 220,000 pounds. And by reducing these readmissions, we release the bed days between 300 to 336 bed days. And for our center, this is allowing elective patients to have their cardiac surgery in more than one month's worth of productivity. So we actually now have 13 months almost, rather than 12 months of activity, and our center receives payment for those additional surgeries. So in summary, for every one pound spent, we're suggesting quite significant cost avoidance, but I, I feel really that improving the documentation that we share between healthcare settings is the biggest win. Our clinicians tell us this is an important tool and our patients tell us that it provides important reassurance, it gives them confidence in caring for their wound, and it helps them in those few cases where there is a concern to take action appropriately. So thank you very much for your time listening today. Thank you.